what family really looks like. Um, just wanted to invite my, my good friend up here. I'd, we had the pleasure with uh, and Chrissy to, uh, and Hannah and I to, to hold the key together of this transition when the transition happened with my father and, and the four of us together, we held that key of what God was going to do in this next period, what he was going what, what to do in this next season uh, of this family. And uh, I've just had the pleasure of, of, of spending, spending a good part of my life with Nate and Christy and uh, uh, Nate, John, and I and the, the Brewer family. We started a business together, and we went through learning about all kinds of things that we need grace, grease in every area. Uh, to work between the cogs, to connect our hearts together. And I put a post on, on us building that business together, and I just said, you know, with all the machinery that we installed and all those other things, what the, the real machinery God was working on was right here. <laughs> it, was the, it was the cogs that needed grace grease for each other, to learn to walk to each other, to change the world. And so I just, would you welcome a world changer right here, Nathan Harris, our associate pastor. Come on up here. It's good. Well, Father, this morning we ask for breakthrough in our lives. I thank you for this month of miracles. I know it's on your heart, and we ask for miracles in our own hearts. We ask that you would do miracles in our own lives. It's not coincidence that we have people in the hospital right now that we love and cherish the enemy's resisting what you're releasing, but we believe that you are the God of the breakthrough. You're the God who delivers. You're the God who sets free. You're the God that saves, heals, and delivers. And this morning, we ask for an outpouring of, of your grace in this area of miracles and signs and wonders that you would, that you would demonstrate your goodness, that your glory would rest on us not just in here, but in our lives, not just when we meet together, but when we're out in the world, when we're interacting with each other, with people, with, with coworkers, and, and um, just individuals we meet, that you would demonstrate your goodness, that your glory would rest on us, that we would be carriers of your presence, that we would be influencers in the world, that we would be world changers, that we would be representatives of your kingdom, that we'd be the ones that the world looks to and says they've got something that we need. And we, we ask for an increase in the impact of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. All right. Well, we're talking about fivefold ministry this, this month. And I get to talk about the gift of the evangelist. Yeah. I love this stuff. You know, when I was, I was thinking about the youth, and, and when I was 18, I had my first encounter with God, right, 18 years old, and it dramatically changed the course of my life. I was, was going down a self-pity, uh, rejection, pornography, uh, no value, no self-worth path, and then Holy Spirit comes in. And in a day, in a day, sets me free. Woo! In a day. Right? March 2019, for some of you guys, in a day set me free and completely changed my life. Completely changed my life. And there's still a process of sanctification, so, you know, know that there are things that come out slowly and things that you grow in. But in a day... He set me free. And, and I've been privileged to, to go from being an introvert personality to an extrovert personality that loves to tell people about Jesus. Where before, I didn't care about people, and I didn't want to be around people. And ever since that day, I've burned to tell people about Jesus. And I can't say that that I am always successful at getting it right, but I have a passion for it. 
And it's a passion that hasn't gone away. It's, it's a passion to be on mission all the time. And God's put that passion in us, and he wants to, he wants to pour it out in the whole body. I want to look at Ephesians 4. We'll get into that in a second. I'm going to read this couple of verses here, Ephesians 4, 10 through 16. Uh, this is uh, the main passage that, that we're dealing with this month on the fivefold gifting. This is kind of the premier passage. And I want to point out a couple of things here that I think are very important for us to understand about the fivefold gifting. So speaking about Jesus, he who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Okay, so Jesus came down and then he went back up. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. All right, so you see the purpose? Equipping. Not just, the, not just those gifts, but those gifts are made to equip the body, right? For equipping the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Okay, so the unity of the faith doesn't happen without the fivefold gifts being released to the body, and the body responds by starting to operate in those gifts, right? So a fivefold evangelist will inspire, motivate, train, and hands-on show the body of Christ how to walk in evangelism, right? The prophets are going to, the, the mature prophets are going to train the body how to hear God, how to discern spirits, how to recognize signs from heaven, and how to release the word of God to other people, right? All these different giftings, the pastor is going to train people on how to connect deeply, train people on how to have the, whatever, 19 relational skills, whatever Tim Johns talks about. Those relational skills necessary are going to train people on how to, to love each other well, so that the body can then turn around and be well connected and can actually belong and bring other people into belonging. Right? All, all of these gifts, until those gifts are functioning and released to the body and then the body responds by operating in those gifts, we won't have unity in faith. Right? And we won't grow to maturity and to the knowledge of the Son of God. So we won't recognize who Jesus is fully until we as the body of Christ fully operate in all five gifts. Not just have five gifts in the room, right? Not just have a representation of people with different gifts, but until the body responds by actually grabbing a hold of those gifts and saying, this is for me. Do you see that? There's a big difference there. Sometimes we talk about fivefold and we, and we don't get to the response part for the body. It's like, oh, yeah, well, we've got apostles, we've got prophets, we've got pastors, teachers, evangelists. Oh, yeah, we got all that in our body, so our leadership team. So, we're, you know, we're good. We're doing this. We're not until we as individual believers come together and say, I'm owning that gift for me. And it wasn't until I owned evangelism, right, that I started practicing evangelism. It wasn't until I owned prophecy it wasn't until I owned it that I went out and actually started practicing prophesying over people. Like, awesome word, uh, Caleb, wherever you are. First time you got to give a prophetic word over somebody, you felt the presence of God hit you. That's, yeah, that's for the whole body. But the, the fivefold prophet is the one that trains, equips, and releases in part so that we all can respond in that. Right? Apostles bring the perspective of heaven. They, they have the blueprint of what God's wanting to do, the big picture, the mission. They're the sent ones. They're the ones sent out to build the church. They're the ones sent out to say, hey, this is, this is the, the roadmap of what God's doing. The apostle lays that out, but the body buys into the vision. Oh, that's what God wants to do in Springfield, Missouri. Okay, I'm going to be involved in that mission in whatever way I can. I'm going to go and be an evangelist of telling people about that mission. I'm gonna start listening to what God says, what heaven says for my life so that I can engage in the area that he's given me influence for that mission, right? The teachers are there to equip the body to know the word of God, 
so that the body can then teach the word of God, right? We don't just rely on teachers to, to teach so that we can have our ears tickled. And then now we have knowledge and we just, we just carry that around, right? No, we take that knowledge, that revelation that we get, that we receive through impartation, through the gift of teaching, and we release it to our coworkers. We, we're able to speak with wise words into what God wants to do in their lives because we know the word, because we have a, a solid foundation keeps us out of falling off the edge and getting into to heresy and, get, and getting into uh, vain teachings. It, it keeps us relevant in the world when the culture says something different than what the Word of God says. Right? But if we just listen to the teaching without becoming teachers, then we'll never see the fullness of unity. All right. So we, you on track with me? So it's important that we respond to the fivefold gifting. We can't just honor the gift in someone else. We actually have to receive it, have it imparted into us, and then begin to activate it. All right. And then we'll be the mature man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So we'll actually start representing Jesus fully when we get to that place as a body. So that we may no longer, and this is what it causes them in the body. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves carried about by every wind of doctrine. By human cunning, by craftiness and, defeat, and deceitful schemes. So you can have the full measure of the teaching gift in your life from a fivefold teacher, be responding with teaching to others and yet still be uh, tossed to and fro. If you don't have the evangelism, if you don't have the apostleship, if you don't have the prophetic, if you don't have the pastoral, not, there's not one gift. Some, sometimes we, you know, we categorize these things as like these distinct, well, this is me over here, this is my vein. It's like, yeah, that's great, but you know what? It's not Father, Son, Holy Word. Holy Bible, it's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? Sometimes as, as teachers, and, and I, you know, I have a little bit of teaching in me, you know, I like to, I like my boxes, you know, all my, I went to Bible school and we had all these boxes that we had all these theologies and all these little, you know, this connects to this and this layer builds on that and then everybody's arguing about which box they like and they don't like and why and if we just have our boxes without the other four gifts, we'll still fall into heresy. We'll still fall into being tossed to and fro, right? So we need each gift. If we're just operating in the prophetic, which is awesome, right? Spirit of God, oh yeah, Spirit of God. It's awesome, power of God. I'm just seeing revelation everywhere, right? I was just up in North Dakota this last, this last I got back yesterday, and... I was listening to um, Mahesh Chavda, or however you say it, that guy. Amazing. Uh, he's, got, he's got a bunch of books, but I was listening to uh, Jeff. Jeff got me reading uh, his one on fasting and prayer. Thank you, Jeff. And then I went ahead and listened to his one on speaking in tongues mm, while I was driving. Man, I was getting revelations, just woo, like numbers and everything, and the Lord's like speaking to me and you know, I'm not like super, I don't like flow a whole bunch in the numbers things all the time. Like, Christy and I used to get 22 all the time. Da, 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 da. Man, I saw 22 this last week like a million times, right? But I was, I was under that anointing from this guy that just has this revelation, right? And I'm praying in tongues and it's awesome. But you can, you can just have that without good teaching, and I like Mahesh because his teaching is so solid, right? But if you don't have that word element, word of God element in with your prophetic, you can end up just off in some little like way out there in space with nobody else connected with you, right? And, and you, you might start buying into voices that aren't the Holy Spirit's voice, right? I mean, I've been there. 
I, I have had some poor theology because of lack of revelation in the word of God, which caused me to think that a voice of condemnation and shame I was hearing was the Holy Spirit, when in fact it was the enemy. And when I recognized that through revelation from the word of God, then I went, wait a minute, I've been believing that voice my whole life. That was a piece of me that carried over from, from that 18-year-old experience when I had that encounter with God. I never let go of that piece. I got to cut that out. And when I started receiving the tender, affectionate love of the Father instead of that voice, the issues which I had struggled with for years because I was under condemnation and couldn't get free from them, all of a sudden they started falling off. Isn't that cool? But the prophetic, the, the hearing had to connect with the word, right? So the effect of this, instead of all that deceit, of only having one or two or three of these gifts, having all, responding to all of these gifts, this is the, the fruit, verse 15. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, okay? So truth and love is the fruit of fivefold ministry gifting response in us, right? Truth and love. It's this amazing balance. Truth and love. And what it produces, I love this, is that, you know, we're growing up in every way, joined and held together by every joint, right? So we got an elbow, we got a shoulder, right? Every joint with which it is equipped. What are the joints? The joints are the gifts. The joint, there's like, I got that apostolic elbow, right? And that, that prophetic knee. Every gift. So you can imagine what the body of Christ looks like in the spirit when we're not operating, when we're not functioning in these. We're just like, you know, got like one thing that doesn't work. And, and we're expecting to represent God in our walk, and yet we're like, you know, it's like, oh. Well, I don't like that prophetic stuff because those guys, they get out there and talking about whatever. Oh, those teachers, they're like so boring. You know, they only talk about, that, you know, the same verse for like 30 minutes. And we're dysfunctional in our walk because we're not receiving what God's wanting not only for us to understand but to live out. Why do we, why do we have a chapter a day, you know, daily Bible reading church-wide. Why do we do that? It's because we want to get the word in us. Why do, we, why do we encourage the body to come to, you know, these activation trainings where we teach on prophetic and, and healing? Because we want to get that stuff into the body. Why do, why do we encourage, you know, going out and doing treasure hunting and stuff like that? We want to get in the body. Why, why do we encourage core family groups? We want to get the pastoral flowing in the body, want to connect. All these things, they, they loosen those joints up. They, they establish areas of truth and love and functionality. Real, it's really practical stuff so that then we can walk and represent him. We're, we're functioning in destiny at that point. It's hard to get from point A to point B when you got, you know, a, a leg that doesn't bend, right? Some of you know, When each part is working properly, I'm still in verse 16, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. All right? So the reason we don't grow is because we have deficiencies in the way that we actively live out these gifts. It's the reason we don't grow. We, we sometimes come up with a lot of reasons, a lot of physical, natural reasons right? Like, oh, our marketing program's not so hot, right? Our advertising's not good enough. You know, we put a sign in the wrong place, don't have a nice enough entrance, or, you know, whatever. We come up with all these reasons, but ultimately the reason is because we have dysfunctionality 
in one or two or three or sometimes all five areas of our walk. And, you know, this individualistic culture that we live in has greatly neglected the pastoral. And because of that, we haven't learned how to properly do community. Right? And so because of that, we have a dysfunction there. Well, that makes it very hard to connect. It makes it very difficult to belong when, you know, the evangelist goes out there and brings in the lost. Oh, I got this person and they just, they just received Christ. I'm going to get them connected. And then all of a sudden, there's, you know, there's no knee joint. And it's like, oh, okay. Well, you can fit in. Uh, let's see. Um, well, we've got, you know, we've got this, uh, you know, ministry over here you can fit into. Maybe you can do that. And they're like, okay, yeah. Well, they're just hungry. Whatever, yeah. And they get in there, and then three months later, they're not around anymore. Because we, we don't have this understanding of how to connect with people on a deep, deep level. Like, how do you do inner healing with somebody, like, in two minutes? I don't know, but we're learning how to do, we're learning how to go deep really fast, right? We're, we're learning how to, to be vulnerable and transparent. We're learning how to build each other up so that when we hear problems, we have a prophetic solution. Whenever we hear problems, we have a, a word from the word of God that teaches them the way to walk in. We have the mission and the vision of what heaven wants to do in their life. That apostolic thing, right? And we've got the evangelism to go out and bring them back in. So it's all of these gifts functioning together. I'm going to jump through here. I haven't even gotten to the evangelist yet. Thank you, Jesus. All right, so I'm just going to run through these really quickly. The... Apostle focuses on the mission of God, what heaven wants to do, okay? Prophet focuses on the spirit of God, right? What's, what's heaven saying? I, I like to think of the apostle as the big picture guy. So he's like the, pulls out his big blueprint map and he's like, this is mission of heaven on earth. The prophet comes along and it's like the watchman on the wall that is seeing out and seeing, little, seeing issues that are about to come or, or specific directions that God wants to take us in a season. So the, the apostle has the big picture view, right? The prophet has the laser view. And the problem is, is the prophet can't see the big picture and the apostle can't see the detail that's about to come up. So they have to work together. So they both have different lenses, and they work together. The prophet sees what's going on and says, hey, there's this thing. I don't know why I'm sensing this. Right, Mike? I don't know why I'm sensing this, but I have a clear word from God that this is an issue. What do you think about that? And the apostle goes, oh, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, because we're, we're working on this over here and this part of the world. We got this thing moving but wow, that could be a real issue. I didn't see that before. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna make an adjustment in our strategy because of that word, right? So that's how they function together. The teachers focus on the word of God, right? Keeping line by line, right? We're building a solid foundation. The evangelist is focused on the lost. So they're always looking. I, I've noticed that whenever I go out in public, I'm always really aware of people around me. Is anybody else that way? Like, because not everybody is. I was, um, I was having lunch with, or breakfast with Steve uh, Wilson one morning, and we were sitting down, and there was just somebody like a table or two away that I just could not get off my mind. And they needed a word, and I knew it. I didn't, you know, I, I, you just couldn't tell by looking at them, but I knew in my heart they needed a word. Well, I, the Holy Spirit was just bugging me about it and bugging me about it. So finally, I you know, went to the restroom or something and so I could come back by their table so I could give them a word. So I gave them a word, you know, and, you know, finished it up, went back over and sat down with Steve. And Steve was like, thank you for doing that, Nate. That is awesome. You know, that's, you're releasing that evangelistic gift. But Steve was completely focused on my needs. 
right? He's got this apostolic fathering thing going on, making sure that, you know, I'm getting built up the right way so that I can function properly and fulfill my destiny. So I'm over here thinking about somebody. I'm talking to Steve, but I'm thinking about this person the whole time, right? And Steve's working on, you know, his, his primary gifting there, speaking into my life. So I found that uh, Steve pointed it out that I had an outward focus there. And so ever since then, you know, for years, I've just noticed that I automatically I'm, just pay attention to people, you know, that are outside of the people I'm talking to. Like, just, you know, I'll be having lunch with somebody and I'll be like, oh, I got a word for you, by the way, as if somebody's leaving, you know. Happens to me all the time. So Jesus... Ooh, I got like five minutes here before response. I want to do some response time. So, all right, Jesus was was uh, an evangelist in many ways, and I want to point out real quickly here. I'm just going to run through these scriptures. A couple of points about evangelists. First of all, Jesus is prophesied about in Isaiah 52:7 as the evangelist. All right, so here's what it says: How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who bring good news, who publishes peace. And who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. All right? The evangelist is the proclaimer of good news. That's what the the Greek word for evangelist means. One who proclaims good news or good tidings. Okay? So Jesus was prophesied to be that. And then in Matthew 4, 23, we see him actually doing this. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming, proclaiming the gospel or the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. Evangelism is deeply connected with the miraculous. Whenever the gospel of the kingdom is preached, signs and wonders follow. They follow the message, and because evangelists preach the message, often follow the evangelist as well. Luke 4, 42. And this is is the heart of Jesus operating as an evangelist, okay? And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him. So he'd just done all this ministry with these people. And then he went off to a desolate place to pray. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving. So they're like, stay here with us and teach us, right? But he said to them, I must preach the good news, right? I'm not going to stay here and teach you for the next six months because there are other people that haven't heard. I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. So the evangelist is always on the go. That, that gifting is always outlook for the next person. Like when I think about my life, I, I can't disconnect it from the nations, right? Because I have a burden for people that have never heard the gospel to hear the gospel. If I'm, if I'm here in Springfield, you know, engaging with believers, I just feel a little twinge of I'm missing something. Like, I got to be out there, you know. Phil, Phil is so pastoral. He can, like, work through your issues. He loves you, and he just works through your issues. And I, I love it because I'll get around Phil, and I'll just feel so encouraged. He's like, oh, yeah, Phil. I know Phil loves me. Like, Phil loves me so much. He brings me chocolate. He Brings me coffee. He came out and put a mirror in the bathroom at our facility. I just felt the presence of God when I went into that bathroom. I've been needing a mirror in that bathroom for fixing, because, you know, you get junk on your face. And I went in there, and I was like, who put that mirror in the bathroom? And then I found out a few days later, it's Phil. I was like, Phil, yes, my pastor. <laughs> but I'm not like that. Like, you know, I'm like that like 20%. But I'll be, you know, love you for a few minutes. I'm like, all right, well, let's go do something. Let's go on an adventure. Let's go find somebody that doesn't know and tell them. Let's go pray for somebody that's sick. Like, my focus is just, it just spun a little bit different. But I've learned 
to operate in that gifting, even though it's not my primary gifting, right? I'm incorporating that into my, my mode of activity. A prime example of this in Scripture, um, Acts chapter 8. Philip the evangelist, speaking of Phil, Philip the evangelist goes to Samaria, preaches the gospel, revival breaks out, he's doing signs, wonders, and miracle services. He's got all these Samarians coming to Christ. It's awesome. And then he calls in the apostles, right? Peter and John, they come out and they lay hands on the people, they receive the Holy Spirit, and they establish the church. Evangelists are great at initiating, but not great at sustaining, right? Evangelists, they, they can break ground, but they're not great at, at cultivating long-term. And he, Philip recognized the need for the apostolic to come in and establish so that the other giftings could flourish. He knew he wasn't gonna be able to pastor long-term. So he brings those guys in, they establish the church, and then those other giftings begin to function. Yeah. I had, a, I had some friends a few years ago that um, their pastor retired. It, you know, large church, several thousand people, and awesome leadership team. They're just, you know, seeing God move in their church. And their pastor of 20-something years retires, and so they've got to find a new pastor. So they're, you know, they're praying about it, and they're looking, and they find this guy uh, from out of state, and they'd listened to his sermons, and, they, you know, went and met him, and, okay, this is, we want to bring this guy in, have him, you know, have him meet him, have him preach at our church. He comes in, preaches the, you know, fiery salvation message, and, you know, God's moving, their people are touched, and, and after a while, they're like, after, you know, him being there for so long, they're like, okay, this is our guy. So they bring him in, but they brought him in as a pastor, but the guy was really an evangelist. You ever been, you ever been to a church where the evangelist is the primary gifting? I have. Let me tell you about it. If you're a sheep in a church with an evangelist, primary gifting, that doesn't recognize the value of the other gifts, then what happens is you get disconnected really quickly because they will be bringing lost people like crazy, like droves. Lost people will be coming in and there'll be plenty of work for you to do, but they're probably not gonna take care of your needs. They're gonna say, you need to be focused on the gospel. Don't worry about that other stuff. Just get them in here, get them saved, and, you know, great commission, raising up an army. Ah! <laughs> well, those churches tend to have a very big revolving door. People get saved, and then they don't feel like they belong after a while, and they get burned out, woo, right back out the door. So they bring this guy in. Well, he doesn't have a, a vision for uh, the pastoral. He only has a vision for evangelism. And so the church explodes at first, right? They, like, start these new ministries. Adoption blows up in the church. People are adopting kids and foster care program stuff. It's blowing up. They start these new ministries to the poor and the homeless, and they're, like, filling up tractor trailer loads of food. And, you know, there's, like, doing these neighborhood outreaches. Church attendance is going up. Things are blowing. It's awesome. But nobody feels connected on the leadership team to the guy. It's just completely, we're doing this. You guys get with the program or, you know, sayonara because we got lost people to reach. And so, you know, I can't remember how long he made it, like six months maybe or something. And the, the back of the camel broke when the uh, worship pastor, you know, full-time staff worship pastor, uh, had emergency surgery. And this guy had just not been connecting with the leadership team in any sort of personal, deep, interactive way, Right? It's just mission, 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 go, 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 go. And the guy doesn't even think about going and visiting the worship pastor in the hospital. Like the guy like might die, you know. And the leadership team is like, enough is enough. This guy doesn't care, doesn't take care of our needs, doesn't want to hear what we have to say. He's out of here. And man, they just, and they were happy to do it. 
But they had to find somebody that had recognized the value of that. And they're still, you know, a growing church and doing well. But the, that one gifting wasn't able to sustain or to carry what God was trying to do in the body because it was only focused on one area, which was outreach. And so we have to, as a body of believers, we have to rally around all five of these gifts to recognize that God's doing something through each one of these. And, and each of us will have a propensity towards one or, one or two of the gifts. We'll be very motivated to, you know, either like me, I'm, I'm more outward evangelistic motivated. But I have to recognize that I need to also value and function in pastoral. I also desperately need to value and function in prophetic, right? I, I desperately need these, these other gifts. And so I've made it a point in my life to practice those things. You know, you write down names in your to-do list. You're like, I'm going to call these people and encourage them, right? And I'm like not that great at it still, but I do it. You know, I call them and I'm like, hey, how are you doing? You know, and then you sit there and listen for 20 minutes. And, you know, my personality is like, hey, you know, let's go do something together. But I'm going to sit here and listen to your needs. Yes, because I need to grow in that area. That makes sense? All right. Well, can I get the ministry team up here? Today we've got this wonderful, young, <clears throat> saints of God, holy saints of God on fire. I really believe what the youth received this week is supposed to touch the body. Yeah, come on. Woo, come on. Just, just all across the front here. Don't be, don't be uh, any, no timidity here. Just spread on out. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Come on. Woo. All right, I got three minutes till the parents are released to get the kids. So what we're going to do is uh, bump back to that evangelist gift for a second. Uh, but I believe there's some people here this morning that God wants to do a miracle for you in your physical body. All right? And one of the issues, you know, Steve, uh, Phil's um, sister... Rachel, we're just talking about her struggling with oxygen and, and breathing, her lungs, her heart. And, and this morning while I was praying about the ministry time, I felt like there are a few people here that are struggling with heart issues or lung issues, breathing issues. And so I want everybody to stand up. If I can get you stand, standing up, I can get you activated here, all right? And if you have one of those issues, I want you to come down here and we're gonna have some youth pray for you. All right, you guys, I want you to pray in twos, so you can just kind of pair up in twos here as we go, okay? And you're just going to do a simple, quick 30-second prayers a couple of times, and then have the person check it out and see if they notice any difference. But we've seen God do some amazing things with hearts and lungs over the years, amen? So if that's you, come on down and receive prayer. Also, if you're having migraines, I want you to come down. All right, we're only gonna do this for about three, four, five minutes here. I'm gonna release the parents in two minutes. So if you're a parent and you're like, ooh, I got that, you better get down here fast so you can get your one minute of prayer and then shoot out. All right, so migraines. If you've got migraines, if you've been struggling with migraines, I want you to come down and receive prayer for that. Thank you, Father. Yeah, if you have been struggling with pain in your knee joints, specifically left knee, I want you to come down for prayer. So pain in your knees. I feel like it's, um, it's um, exercise related for one or two of you as well. Like you, you're trying to exercise, but it's hurting and you just can't push through that. That's you. I want you to come on down. Yeah. Oh, like I still got like six people left. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. If you have had problems with itching feet, I know it's random. Itching feet feet. I mean, it, I'm not going to make you raise your hand. If you have itching feet issue, I want you to come down for prayer, okay? We still got maybe one or two over here, okay? You guys pray quick, so Holy Spirit, yeah, release it right now. Thank you, Father. All right, one minute left till I release the parents. So, Father, right now, in Jesus' name, just stretch your hands out to these guys. Right now, in Jesus' name, we invite you, Holy Spirit. We ask that you manifest your glory this morning. We ask for full restoration in these bodies right now. I ask for nutrients of the kingdom 
because of these miracles to be poured out, that, that there would be mindset shifts because of these miracles, that, that there would be a change in the way that, that these individuals operate because of these miracles, that they would recognize that, that Jesus is their manna right now in Jesus' name. And then one other one I, I was getting earlier, I forgot, is if you've been struggling with anxiety, and I know it's not specifically just a physical issue, but, but it, it has physicality to it, if you've been struggling with anxiety, uh, I want you to come down as well, okay? Thank you, Father. All right. So parents, you can go get your kids. If you're being prayed, just, you know, give them like the 30-second tap, like, hey, I got, I got to get out of here. I want to honor our children's workers. Thank you, Father. Yeah. And then if you up here that are being prayed for, if you are seeing a change in your body right now, if, you're, if something's happening, something profound, I mean, not just like, oh, that might be better, maybe, I don't know. But if, you, if there's something profound happening, I want you to come over up to me and share it with me because it's really powerful to hear the testimonies of what God's doing. I was, um, I was on a mission trip down in Mexico a couple years ago, and I had, I had um, oh, there were about 10 people that got healed during what I'm calling a laughing event. You know what a laughing event is? Everybody just laughs, and you laugh over the enemy. You laugh over, over your, your problems in your body. And so, I, you know, you, you, you do these things, these activations and, you know, these impartations. And you don't know, maybe God's doing something, maybe he's not. So I, I asked, is there anybody that's had, that's had something substantial happen in your body, um, especially if it's something that you've had a long time, and then God's healed it, and you want to share that this morning, and I want you to come forward well, I had about 10 people come up, and I thought, okay, maybe there's some light headaches or something, you know, here going on. I go down the line with these people, and some of the most dramatic healings I'd seen on that trip happened when we had a laughing event for one minute. I mean, it was crazy, but in, in the natural, I had no awareness of the presence of God. You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't feel anything. And I didn't even see anything happen. They're just praying. They're in Spanish anyway, so who knows what they're saying. They're down here praying. And they come up, and it's just person after person after person is sharing these amazing miracles that happened because the word of God, the good news of God was preached, and miracles, signs, and wonders follow because that's how it works. That's who he is. He wants to demonstrate his goodness. So if something's happening in your body right now that's profound, you know, there's at least 85% uh, you know, healing in your body. We want to hear about it this morning. So if anybody has that, just, just catch me here and we'll share a couple of things, okay? Thank you, Father. Yeah. Jesus. All right, I might hop back on the mic here in a minute if we have some cool stuff to share. But you guys just keep going. All right, so make sure you got your kids if you haven't gone yet, people being prayed for. And um, I might hop back up here. I might not. We'll see what happens. But I love you guys. I'm so grateful for walking with you. I'm so encouraged by what God's doing in our body and our lives. Amen. And I'm, I'm so excited to get to learn how to operate in the giftings that I lack in. And I hope you are too. Amen. All right. So be blessed. We'll see you guys sometime soon, okay?